My name is Dave. I'm 36 years old, divorced, with a teenage son, who I was determined to give a better life than the crummy one I had growing up. My dad was a violent alcoholic, who took out all his pent-up rage on me and my mom before finally walking out on us when I was 15. Those childhood traumas left me with severe anxiety issues that made it hard to keep any job for too long. I was constantly on edge, always expecting some new crisis to destroy any semblance of peace I found. When I started the night watchman gig at Markin's Auto Parts and Accessories, it felt like a perfect fit. Just sit alone in that cramped trailer filled with monitors showing every angle of the warehouse and parking lot. No demanding bosses or rude customers to deal with, just an utterly solitary routine where I could avoid any possible conflicts. Unfortunately, my usual paranoia turned out to be justified this time. Three months into the job, I settled into the rickety lawn chair near the monitors and prepared for another totally uneventful night shift. Around 2 a.m., something caught my eye on the camera feed displaying the delivery dock in the back of the warehouse. A lean figure dressed in black fatigues was quickly slipping through the unlocked side door. An intruder, my heart started pounding as I fumbled for the panic button that was supposed to alert the police. This can't be happening. This isn't real, I muttered as sheer terror paralyzed me momentarily. The lean figure was now creeping through the warehouse carrying a large duffel bag, stuffing merchandise off the shelves inside. Just a thief after money or valuables, probably not expecting anyone to be here. I finally regained just enough composure to punch the panic button and call out, Hey, I know you're in there over the loudspeaker system. The figure froze, dropping the duffel bag before whipping out a handgun and aiming it directly at the nearest camera. Boom! The gunshot blast shattered the lens as I recoiled in horror. Just take whatever you want and leave. Please don't hurt me. I screamed through trembling lips, watching the figure on the remaining camera feeds as they stalked towards the trailer I was trapped inside. With each step, I could make out more chilling details through the grainy video quality. It was a young man around 20 with sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, and a deranged stare. Stringy dark hair hung down over his gaunt face and bony hands clutched the gun with a vice grip. He reached my trailer door and lingered outside for an agonizing moment. The doorknob slowly rattled before being flung open as he barged inside. Teeth gritted, eyes wild like a feral dog, his boots smashing on the rusted metal floor as he closed in on me. Please, I, I, I have cash in m my wallet, I blubbered, frozen in panic as he raised the handgun directly at my face. I don't want your stupid money, he snarled through clenched teeth, cold eyes narrowing into merciless slits. You were watching me, spying on me like all the others. Well, no more. I'm done being watched. The gun was now inches from my forehead, his skinny index finger tightening around the trigger as spittle flew from his cracked lips. In that moment, staring into the abyss of his soulless eyes, I saw a lifetime of torment and darkness that had driven this person to the brink of utter insanity. Part of me almost envied that he seemed to feel no fear anymore, no constraints, while I was utterly consumed by dread. Please, I'm begging you. I have a son. He needs me. I wailed as tears streamed down my cheeks, innards feeling like they were filled with white-hot magma. The slightest flicker of humanity briefly flickered across his gaunt face before being consumed by the raging inferno within once again. I braced for the thunderous roar, the blazing bullet that would obliterate me in an instant. That's when a deafening bang exploded from outside. Police sirens wailed as heavy boots pounded on the pavement outside. The deranged intruder's head whipped around just as the trailer door flew open. Two towering officers in riot gear rushed inside, leveling their guns squarely at him. Drop the weapon, get on the ground now. One bellowed as the crack of a taser whined through the air, electrified prongs lancing into the assailant's back. He stiffened and collapsed onto the floor, gun clattering away as he convulsed. As the cops swarmed to subdue and cuff the twitching psychopath, I collapsed backward in the creaky lawn chair in utter relief, shaking, sobbing, and clinging to life. That was almost three years ago now. I still have nightmares about those hollow eyes, that feral snarl the evil that radiated from that person's very being. I quit the night watchman gig immediately after, taking a local construction labor job instead, where I could work during the day and spend evenings at home with my son. I still struggle with crippling anxiety, but have learned to cherish the simple fact that I survived that nightmare 
and get to see another sunrise. As for the gunman, his name was Metzger, just a 21-year-old former honor student who had descended into psychosis after his parents died in a car accident during his freshman year of college. The tragic loss of his only family shattered his mind, fueling a persecutory delusion that he was under constant surveillance. He remains confined to a maximum security psychiatric facility. It was just another night on the graveyard shift for me. That's when I saw him through the chain link fence. Jared, my old line partner from before I got promoted to maintenance, was stumbling down the road that ran along the back of the property. Even from a distance, I could recognize his lumbering gait and ragged clothes. Jared had been a decent enough guy when we worked together. Quiet, kept to himself mostly. But the alcoholism got him in the end. He'd stumble in reeking of cheap whiskey, eyes glazed over. Lines sloppily assembled until they had to let him go. After he got canned, I'd see him panhandling sometimes when I drove through town. His scraggly brown hair and beard had gone fully gray. Weight dropped off his skinny frame until his cheeks were hollow. Those cloudy blue eyes just stared at nothing. I watched him veer off the road, cutting across the patch of weeds toward the plant fence. As he got closer, I could hear the rustling of his tattered jacket. The stench of stale booze and piss wafted ahead of him. That's when he looked up, and our eyes met. In that moment, the dull haze cleared, and a crazed spark flickered behind his gaze. Jeff! He shouted, words slurred. Where you been, buddy? I've been looking all over for you. Instinctively, I took a step back as he closed in on the fence. Up close, I could see the grime caked on his face, the patchy stubble and cracked lips. Hey man, take it easy, I said, keeping my distance. You can't be back here. It's private property. Don't give me that mumbo jumbo, he spat back. We're pals, ain't we? Let me buy you a drink for old time's sake. With a sinking feeling, I realized he was still out of his mind drunk. The strained smile on his cracked lips looked more like a pained grimace. Listen, Jared, you gotta get out of here before I call security. His twisted grin faded as his eyes narrowed to slits. So that's how it's gonna be, huh? Think you're better than me now that you've got that fancy promotion? He grabbed hold of the chain link, giving it an angry rattle that sent a chill down my spine. In a flash, he produced a rusty box cutter flicking out the dull blade. Maybe I ought to take you down a peg, put you on my level where you belong. My heart pounded as I took another step back. Every muscle in my body told me to turn and run, but I was paralyzed, watching this broken shell of a man rant and rave mere feet away. You never did show me no respect on the line, always barking orders like you was my babysitter. Spittle flew from his cracked lips as the rage poured out in a wave of bitterness and delusion. I could smell the sourness of his breath even at a distance. And you know what the real kicker is? I always suspected you were peace was sweet on my wife. His wife? The revelation hit me like a load of bricks. I vaguely remembered Jared mentioning having a family once, but that felt like a lifetime ago for both of us. Before I could muster a response, Jared flew into another frenzy. He wedged the blade into the chain link fence and started sawing away like a madman. The harsh grind of metal filled the night as he sliced back and forth with manic determination. All I could do was watch in shocked silence as he created a hole just barely big enough for his wiry frame to squeeze through. He tossed the crude tool aside with a clang and started ramming his shoulder into the tear, grunting with each impact as the link slowly bent and parted wider. My instincts finally kicked in and I turned to run, sucking in a deep breath to yell for help. But before I could let it out, Jared came barreling through the fence straight at me. I felt a dull thud against my back as we both hit the ground hard. The metallic tang of blood filled my nostrils as blinding pain shot through the back of my skull. Jared's face appeared above me, wild and contorted. His bony hands gripped my shirt collar as he straddled my chest, panting like an animal. For a fleeting moment, I wondered if this was how it ended for me. Then just as quickly, an ear-piercing siren pierced the night and bright spotlights bathed the area. Jared looked up, blinking in confusion as the blinding lights washed over us. In the security monitoring room, the graveyard shift guards had been watching the events unfurl on the grainy black and white cameras. They saw the deranged vagrant slice open the chain link fence, squirming his way through the jagged hole like a demented caterpillar. They witnessed him charge at me in a drunken frenzy, 
tackling me to the ground in a tangle of flailing limbs. One of the guards quickly hit the alarm, sending the klaxon's shrill wail slicing through the still night air. Two of the burlier officers, Jenkins and Mallet, sprang into action. With practiced efficiency, they grabbed their radios and nightsticks before rushing out of the monitor room toward the commotion outside. By the time they reached us, Jared was straddled over me, his bony hands gripping my shirt collar as he panted like a rabid animal. Mallet reacted first, grabbing Jared by the back of his tattered jacket and wrenching him off me with a grunt of exertion. Jenkins stepped in to cover his partner, the bright beam of his tactical flashlight blinding the wild-eyed Jared. Don't move, dirtbag, he barked. Mallet spun Jared around, pinning his scrawny arms behind his back as he slapped on a pair of heavy steel restraints. Jared sputtered and raged incoherently, but was effectively immobilized. Had a nice peek at the show, did you? Mallet taunted, giving the cuffs an extra yank that made Jared wince. Should have bought a ticket instead of trying to sneak in. With Jared finally contained, Jenkins crouched down to check on me, shining the bright LED light in my eyes as I lay there stunned on the pavement. You all right, pal? Nutcase didn't get you too bad, did he? His gruff voice had a surprising touch of concern as he looked me over. I could only muster a dazed nod as the adrenaline finally started to wear off. Seeing the crazed desperation in Jared's face in those final moments had chilled me to the bone. If the guards hadn't arrived when they did, I shuddered at the thought. It was around 11 p.m. as I pulled into the parking lot of Diner, this rundown little joint on the rougher side of town, the kind of place where you wouldn't want to linger too long after sundown. But their burgers were decent, and it was right on my way home, so I stopped in a couple nights a week when I didn't feel like cooking. I worked the overnight custodial shift at a manufacturing plant on the outskirts of the city. It wasn't a glamorous job by any means, but it paid the bills and allowed me to keep my days free to spend time with my kids. Ever since Maggie left five years ago, that was my whole world, working nights and being a dad during the days. I pulled my baseball cap low over my tired eyes as I stepped out into the harsh glow of the parking lot lights. Making my way towards the diner's entrance, I noticed a rusted out old pickup parked across the way, its owner slumped over behind the wheel. Probably just some drunk passed out after having one too many at the bar. I tried not to pay it much mind. The familiar smell of greasy burgers and stale cigarette smoke hit me as I stepped through the diner door. Only a few regulars populated the booths and counter stools at this hour. I gave a cursory nod to Shelly, the friendly middle-aged waitress who worked most nights. Hey there, Cal. The usual, she chirped in her thick accent. I managed a half smile and settled onto a cracked vinyl stool, eager to chase away the chill that had set into my bones. As I waited for my food, I replayed the message I had gotten from my ex earlier that evening. Her tone was frantic, almost manic, as she begged me to loan her $5,000 to pay off some debts she had racked up. The amount was astronomical. There was no way I could come up with that kind of cash on such short notice, even if I wanted to help her. Which, if I'm being honest, I didn't. Not after everything. My thoughts were interrupted as the tinny bell above the door jangled. I glanced over and felt my stomach drop. It was the guy from the truck, stumbling in with a wildness in his bloodshot eyes. He reeked of stale booze and bad decisions as he swayed his way towards the counter, practically falling into the stool beside me. Hey, hey buddy, he slurred, jabbing me roughly with his elbow. You got, you got any cash? I need, need some money, man. I shot him an icy look and firmly shook my head, eager to avoid any conflict, but he was persistent, growing more erratic and animated by the second as he pestered me for funds. Maybe he just needed a few bucks for a hot meal, or a warm bed for the night. But something in his intensity put me on edge. Please, man. Please. I'm in deep shit. I need help, he rambled, now gripping my arm with surprising strength. These guys, they're gonna hurt me if I don't get the money. I'll do anything, anything. His wild gesticulating caused him to knock over my fresh mug of coffee, the scalding liquid sloshing across the counter towards me. I recoiled, shoving him away firmly as the hot liquid began to seep through my shirt. That's when I felt it, the unmistakable shape of a gun 
jutting out from the back of his tattered jacket. My heart pounded as his face contorted into a mask of rage. In one fluid motion, he whipped the pistol out and leveled it directly at my chest. A terrified hush fell over the diner. Give me your money. All of it. Now! He screamed, spittle flying from his cracked lips. His hands shook erratically, rendered even more unpredictable by the alcohol and drugs no doubt coursing through his veins. With my heart in my throat, I slowly raised my hands in compliance and tried to speak in a low, calming tone. Hey man, take it easy. You don't want to do anything rash here. My words fell on deaf ears as his muddled mind fixated solely on the gun. Shelley had crouched behind the counter, sobbing in fear. The other patrons shrunk away, rendered helpless. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing myself for the inevitable. Gunshots rang out, deafeningly loud in the confined space. A fiery pain erupted in my shoulder and chest as I collapsed backwards, everything moving in flashes. Sirens, more gunfire, screams, and then... nothing. I drifted in and out of consciousness, clinging to life. When I finally awoke, groggy and disoriented in a hospital bed, I learned that the deranged junkie had been gunned down by an off-duty cop who had walked in on the chaos. A bystander caught in the crossfire, that's all I was. Trapped for weeks to recover from my wounds, both physical and mental, I became reclusive and withdrawn.